And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us straight from Talarius Gaming, currently developing the Legends of Kralis. A man who a man raised in the mountains, forged and forged in the desert. So in, in other words, a dual elemental. <laughs> and, and more the, or less. Yeah. And the head and the head honcho of the of the of this level of this lovely band of misfits. <coughs> the one and only Levi Davis. How are you doing today, man? Good and you. That's a heck of an introduction. Wow. That was, I, um, I've had my fair share of practice. Um, right on. I try and I try and go as grand as I can without risking getting sued by the Buffer family. <laughs> right. Those, those guys are dicks. They can be absolutely. Then again, then again, then again, I suppose Vegas does that to people. Oh, or or Phoenix. I've heard I've heard Phoenix people are a special bunch. I would say so. Yes, I would think they were a special bunch. Yes. I only, I only know I only, the closest I know about it is the t is the time that some gr some girl tried to get into her house Santa style and got stuck. Wow, wow! <laughs> As in, they had to call the fire department to get her out to get her out of the damn chimney. That's just insane. I that just blows my mind. I, why would you ever climb down a chimney? Just what 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 would you go through your brain mind to think? Hey, I'm can fit down that chimney. Um, huh. I ha I have no I have no idea, but it's fu but it's fun to point and laugh. Um, as as Mel Brooks once said, tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. Right. Now, right. I'd like to start off at the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Wow, that's that that would so we're gonna go way back, like way back. It's nineteen seventy seven. Uh, I'm seven, and one of my friends has got this interesting game in which we get to play um, fighting men or elves, or prior to that, um, hobbits before they became halflings, and you just ignited in you know the imagination inside me as it does for most players i guess right most gms that ultimately and i just couldn't get enough of it in 1977 for christmas i was gifted and i still have it the uh white box um the 1977 version after they got sued by the tolkien estate to remove hobbit from their games yeah um from my experience while i understand why they do it the tolkien estate tends to be a bit douchey. <laughs> well, I mean, they've got an IP to protect. I mean, you know, I mean, most I can, people got IPs that they want to protect. So oh, I, I can, I can understand that. Um, it's just that I've, I've had some, I've had some stories relayed to me with, with some RPG developers who had, to, who had to work with the estate, and <laughs> it, um, they're, they were not the best at, at communicating. I'll go, well, yeah. <laughs> Is one is one way to is one way to put it, but it's interesting that you that you started out with white box because a lot of um a lot of a lot of a lot of folks who who started out with early D and D that I've had on the show usually ended up starting with either BX or Beck me. I don't hear white right. box all that often. Well, yeah, I don't think you're going to hear white box often because it's it's very, I mean it's it's old, right? I mean, it just goes to show you how old I actually am. Um, and a lot of people, they start off with the red box and BX and all that, and then they move up from there and, uh, they look back and they've got like this, uh, grand, I, you know, I, I played it since the beginning and I, and I keep hearing the, uh, the lion speaking, you know, don't talk to me about ancient magic. I was there when it was laid. <laughs> um, when we start talking about the white box, I've even got the chain mail rules that you need to be able to play the white box. Mm. Um, because it wasn't a contained system before what? B BX, I think. Yeah. Yeah, BX. Yeah, that was the next one up. Now, it tech it technically is, but then we then we 
I remember tr I remember trying to co trying to codify a timeline, and then you bring in the Moldave and the and the Cook um slight at ed slight edits and the blue ver and the blue version, and it gets it get it, it gets, gets weird. It gets very weird very quickly. I think the only I think the only bigger offender when it comes to there are there are three there are three big offenders for me when it comes to trying to nail down their early nail down their early timeline into something that I can codify. Early D and D is one of them. The second one is early RuneQuest. Right. And the third one is Traveler. Traveler is the least offend is the least big offender, if only because its its whole thing is system and company jumping over the last um, fifty years. Right. Right. Oh. I actually think I've still got the original RuneQuest box that I that I had from back then. Yeah. I have to go digging it up. I have they were really into box sets back then as well to get all the rules out, and I don't know why. It's actually it seems to me to be more costly to do box sets than anything anymore. Oh. The manufacturing side of things. I'm gu I'm guessing because of all the extra stuff that you've got that you've got to put into a proper box set. Right. I mean, you've got you've got to put in you, you've got to put in a first off you have to you have to slim down the rules in order in order to make it fit. You have to you have to put in some you have to put in some character sheets some some um, rep, some reference stuff some add-ons you have to put in some dice um, sometimes a pencil right and dice mm -hmm. um, in some ca in some cases car in some cases cards like the Dragonlance Fifth Age um, box set right or the box set for Shatter Zone but. I know you. St Would it be fair of me to say that you weren't exactly a one-system lifer, given the leap between the kind of fantasy that um, that white box D and D was, and the kind of fantasy that um, le that Legends of Kralis is? Legends of Kralis, yeah, it's it wasn't. I mean, I've played, so I cut my teeth on the on the white box, but I've also cut my teeth on Rollmaster. Mm -hmm. um, I played I played a ton of Shadowrun. Traveler was in there. Um. Uh, God, there's so many that I just can't think of that. Um, let me let me play a bit of a lightning round when it comes to, or not necessarily lightning round, but a bit of word association when it comes to certain names and and whether or not you've delved into them. Um, okay. Talislanta. Yes. Oh, all right. Um, Harn. Yes. Don't hear that one often, do you? <laughs> no, that's that's that one's by Columbia Games. That's a lot of people don't. I don't hear that very often anymore. Um, well, you already you already mentioned you already mentioned Traveler. Um, let me go. Right. Let me go. Let me go full Turbo Nerd. Um, GURPS. Ooh, Turbo Nerd. Let's go. Uh, which one? GURPS. Oh, GURPS. Are you kidding me? I love GURPS. Gen <laughs> uh, generic universal role playing. But I think that's also part of the reason why I wanted to go with classes is because of GURPS. But I don't, I don't think, I think GURPS is so much a toolbox, such a huge toolbox that it's really hard for players and GMs to actually get it. I, um, I like a good handle on it. I have, I have, I have um, told some of my students that universal, you, do, you shouldn't look at universal style games as a game. You should look at it like a programming language. You right, exactly. Like you've got. Like you've like you have um, the Unreal Engine. I know I know for some people using vi using video game references with tabletop is verboten, but it's my show, my rules. <laughs> um, right, it should be your rules in your show. Well, that that and um, video games and tabletop games have a closer relationship than people think. Going all the way back to the to the old um, SSI um, board games, not board games, video games. What am I? What am I saying? Yeah, video games. Um. I'd say so. Um, you already, you already mentioned you already mentioned um Rune Qu you already mentioned RuneQuest, so I can knock that one off off of the, right. off of the um, list. Um, I'd say I'm fair. I'm fairly. I'm fairly certain you've di you've dipped it. Um, Aeon. Aeon. In what? Aeon. Um. Tr Aeon. Tr the game that was supposed to be called Aeon, but they had to call it Trinity because the makers of Aeon Flux got got pissy about it. I've heard it, but I never played it. Mm -hmm. Right, I've heard about it. I just never delved into it and never played it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, now this is t um, Elf Quest. Yes, that's actually so. I'm actually looking at my appendix N for my game masters um, thing, and yeah, it's right there. It's Elf Quest. So is Gamma World. Mm -hmm. um, Harp. Yep. Um, let's, I remember this. Um, any, uh, um, I could I could go with any manner of the games that have been based that have been based off of Tecumel, but I'll use um I'll use a more recent one in Birthorn. No. But I'm um, I'm assuming that you're I'm assuming that you're familiar with the set with the Tecumel setting at 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 the least based on how you said that. At the very least, yeah. I mean, I've, I'm familiar with it, but I, I've never played it. I've never, no one's ever said, "Hey, come play this." In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a game of it being played. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So that's definitely that's definitely a that's definitely a wide variety, and you've um, you've me given some given some of the given some of the names that you mentioned. That you mentioned, Kralis is is an inspiration. I can, I um, I can assume that Kralis is kind of an amalgamation of a lot of, of a lot of inspirations. What prompted the idea to to um be to start this particular adventure? Was it just, was it just well, something that you had been that you had been kicking around for years in your in your own <laughs> games? So you know, being an old grogner like myself, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was the was the game that most people played back in the '90s before Third Edition. And so we started playing around, taking the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons rules, taking classes of, out of them, and kind of morphing it into a what happens if we actually take the Call, Call of Cthulhu rules or Chaosium rules with the D100 and all these other systems, and kind of just did that. And it started off as a very bad homebrew. I mean, it was horrible. And we, we were changing rules. We were taking things out like that. And it just kind of developed that way. And then, you know, life, marriage, and all that other stuff kind of gets in the way of, of things and development and work. And it got to the point where people were, they would ask about it. And we'd be playing it at the local game store. And they're like, hey, this is really fun. What do you, you know, you guys can do anything with it. And someone had the brainy I don't know if it was a brainy idea or brainy sarcasm. Well, why don't you just make it a real role-playing game? And back in the early 90s, late 90s, there wasn't much you could do unless you were like with a big publisher, right? And we're talking Chaosium, TSR, uh, the up-and-coming Wizards of the Coast when they when they purchased it. So everything we were doing was on Word, and then I transferred it in the early 2000s to PageMaker, and we just kept building it and building it and, and playing with it, and it just got to a point where... We were at conventions playing it, and people started liking it, um, and we just kept developing, and then it just got to a point where like, well, is this a hobby, or do we want to do something different with it? And we decided to try to do something different with it. Um, so it's been in in on and off development over several years. Mm -hmm. Now, you describe Legends of Kralis as a heroic Aetherpunk game. Right, Aetherpunk, so yeah. I think I think one thing we need to get we need to get out of get out of the way very quickly is what is Aetherpunk? The best description I can give you is the blending of magic and technology, uh, in which technology either is greatly influenced or powered by magic itself. I guess the best the best description would be playing Magic: The Gathering in some of the in some of their in some of their uh, expansion sets, um, where you're able to do technology, you know, um, and magic at the same time, in a sense, um, with some of those backgrounds and things that they were doing. And it's 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 a subgenre of like punk, right? You've got cyberpunk, steampunk, um, uh, 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 steampunk, um, metal punk, uh, and then you've also got um, Iron punk and uh, diesel punk, right? It's just another genre. It's still all kind of punkish, um, and it's kind of out there. So I think that's you know that's the, I think that's the best best definition. It's just a blending of absolute magic and technology, mm -hmm. where neither one is is important or or, or lesser than the other. Mm -hmm. And I can de I can definitely see that with some of the some of the with some of the inspirations you list on the Kickstarter page. Um, some of Star Wars, Dune, Red Redwall, Stargate, Princes of Mars, 
War of the War of the Worlds. Um, I'm surprised. I'm surprised you didn't. I'm surprised you didn't reference uh, Masters of the Universe. <laughs> Well, there is a bit of Masters of the Universe in there, um, but not as much as I would say uh, Thundercats. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I was fortunate enough to have a father that went to different business conventions that sold a lot of different things to different people, and I got my hands on Valerian and Lorelei magazines uh, comics um, back then, and that really was a huge inspiration because of the awesome heroicness that is that comic book when it comes to travel and space and it was just all this different kind of concepts mm -hmm. um and then as i got older obviously arthur c clark actually is a good reference for this because you know magic is just technology that we just don't understand yet yeah. right and i think that's where i pull a lot of that from mm -hmm. and with then with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind um this this is a this is as good as a good a time as any to go to go into the to go into the mechanics. Um, sure. Now you're you're using a per, since you it's a, since you you um you said that early on the idea that you had was take a D and D and tur, and turn it into and um fusion dance it with the D, with the percentile based roles in um base in basic role playing. Right. Um. And. With that, with that kind of thing, with that kind of thing in mind, what ma what made you what made you pick that percentile system more than anything else? Well, because of the gr well, granularity is a simple answer, right? It's one of those things that we actually liked about the granularity. It actually exploded out the the uh, d twenty into m larger portions that allowed us to do some really cool things. Um, but it also allowed us to watch skills develop in a way that is percentile based, right? Or, or and all this other stuff but then we got to a point where it's like we wanted more than just a pass or fail right or or anything like that so we we cut off the percentage of a d100 and then we decided let's take the die pool of shadow run or vampire the masquerade or world of darkness that most people know now let's crunch that into the rolling of a d100 and then we started counting Qual uh, not only if you f uh, success uh, pass or fail, but how many or how well your su successes were. So then we said, okay, do we want to do every five or every ten? Five was way too much when it came to a power curve. So we decided on ten being the uh, the standard that we would do things for. So then we came up with, okay, if you roll into your skill, and for every ten below that, you gain one success, and then from that one success, we can multiply and use that in in any way. And then we also decided. It was it was interesting how it came by came about the fact that you could actually use that as a negative too, right? Like if you failed by certain number of successes, let's let's say you have a skill just for fifty for ease, and you rolled a seventy, well, that's a that's a failure of two successes. Um, where if you rolled a thirty, it's a it's a success with two successes. And the the game masters that we were playing with and we played could narrate the story going back and forth, like you know, okay, the lock if you failed with two successes isn't opening because you've got your thief your thieves picks uh stuck in it a critical failure would be you snapped off and now the lock is ruined and you can't open it oh by the way there's you know a legion of goblins at your back mm -hmm. kind of concept um and that's where that's what we did with that and it was interesting when we were developing it we started seeing a lot of weirdness with the new d20 system that was coming out with for third edition we're like oh my god brain drain <laughs> You know, someone's spying on us kind of thing, right? Um, and we just start, we just turned it up to 100% on that. And now we just use the 2D10 to simulate a score between 0, 1 and 0, 0, which is um, a rolling three zeros on 2D10. And that's where we went. Yeah. And when it comes now, shifting it, shifting into the, shifting into that, um, because of the fact that it's do that that it's doing um, degrees of success essentially degrees of success and degrees of failure on that rule of ten, um, I am cur I'm curious if there I if there is some variant of um, cr of critic of criticals or some sort of e some sort of extra in the same way that um, Shadowrun had Shadowrun had glitches or the or the one to five rule that was that's that was in RuneQuest, or the 95 rule that's in um, Rollmaster. 
So we took both of those, right? We we took the one to five that's in RuneQuest, which is not one through out five. That's a critical hit. And 96 and above yeah. is a failure, no matter what your score is, which allowed us to get scores into hundreds, you know, like two or 300 above things. And then you're just adding successes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the way it is. So if you're rolling out one through out five as a standard, you've got a critical success. And then we, we threw in the idea of instead of rolling again to see how many successes you got, we just say you roll a critical determination die of, of a D10 and that explodes on a 10. Right, so as long as you keep rolling tens, you it explodes on you, and then on the critical failure end, um, two things happen. One, you either critically failure and you completely botch it, or if you're in combat and let's say you physically you you uh, mess up your physical defense, you actually have messed up your defense check so badly you give your opponent additional successes against you. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in one sense you could out even say, well, that also applies to doing other things, right? Um, I mean, there's so much variation and ca capability with the NAT D100 that the options seem limitless. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember how Eclipse Phase use, has its criticals um, rely solely on whether or not you roll doubles. Um, right. Which, which prompted me to call it the but and rule. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I see where you're going with that, right? The but and rule, yeah. Absolutely. But for me, I think that's a little too much, right? I mean, every time you roll a, a double, right, you score a critical, which means a lot of criticals, criticals are going to be happening in the first place. Um, we all have a lot of uh, criticals just in the fact that when you're rolling out one through out five, um, you score a critical. Like in today's game that I was playing with uh, some, some amazing people in Britain, um, they scored a lot of criticals rolling out one throughout five, you know, and I'm like, wow, you know, so it's, it's not as rare as everybody thinks it is. So having a basically for doubles, right? Anytime you roll doubles, that's a lot of crits. If you think about it, right? Anytime you roll an 11, 11, 22, a 33, a 44, a 55, 66, 77, 88, 99. And then I guess at, at 100, that's 10 times the normal of successes or no 10 times the amount of crits that we have in one game session, and we have a lot of crits. And you know, it's only, it's only a matter of time before somebody makes a T-shirt. <laughs> it's only make make a T-shirt that says "Too legit to crit," and that, that oh is, yeah, that is, a ter that is terrible, <laughs> and I should feel terrible. But you can't shame a man who has no shame. Um, no, you can't. Actually, that's actually not a bad thing. Too legit to crit. Uh, but. The when I when it comes to character when it comes to character creation, there's a few there's a few aspects I want to I want to delve into just to see their particular um, impact. The first being um, spe um species and cu and cultural kin because in a lot of games in general and a lot of fantasy games especially, species your choice of race, species, ancestry, whatever matters in matters in the early stages, but by late game it's irrelevant. Role playing, notwithstanding, because anything, because anything can matter in ro in role playing. There's way there's way too many moving parts to put to factor that in. Um, how mu how much of a factor does what does one cho one's choice of species make in in the early game and even in the late game possibly? Um, I think it's just uh, because we're a classless system, it's just as important as picking your class, if not more so. Because when you pick a species, not only get a certain amount of species traits that are specifically built for those different species, but you also get species abilities mm -hmm. um, uh, that your specific species has access to. And so you can have four of the same type of species, but they'll be completely different because they've each chosen two different uh, types of species abilities that which is what folk is where we start to focus on things mm -hmm. uh With in the in the sh in the long game and in the short game those those are very important species are important you know it's it's more than just a like a plus 10 to this hit or plus 10 to that hit it's like um we have a species called the bahul and one of their uh, species abilities is the ability to do a uh power charge um which we have charging rules. It, they these supple these supersede and give bonuses to those charging rules, and that is 
can be used at any time, right? And it's always going to be important either at first or beyond, um, beyond whatever ranking you want to get to. It doesn't matter. It's always going to be important. So with that, with that in mind, the other thing is um, focus. And given given the fact that you brought up Role Master as as a game in your formative days, um, is it a ca- is it a case where your fo- where your focus determines what where you're going to be um, where you're going to be spending stuff more? Yes. No and but. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so a focus is as close to a type of class that we have, right? We, we have four focuses. We have your combat. Any type of anybody that wields a weapon is considered a combat if you want to be that, right? So you can take um, names of, say, rangers, paladins, knights, fighters, barbarians, uh, edge lords, whatever, and you can make them. That's combat. Then we have our knowledge, which is obviously focusing on those that can cast spells or other things. Then we have our social, which are our bards, um, divine casters, people who do that. And then we have our stealth, which are all the roguish types, right? Mm-hmm. So that's as close to classes as we get. And when you get in there, um, that how does that relate, right? So that relates to our skills, right? So all our skills are broken down into those four categories. So if you choose, say, knowledge focus, any skill that, any four skills, let me be specific, any four skills that you have that you choose that are in knowledge gain an additional plus 10 from your focus. So those are called focus skills, right? Um, And they give you bonuses for that. Um, You also gain access to two more abilities that come from your focus, your, 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 the focus of your abilities, right? Which is combat, social, stealth, and knowledge, right? So you gain those. Those are free. You don't even have to meet the prerequisites for those. Those are things that are just who you are and as you develop them. Um, and then you gain bonuses to attributes based off your focus. Um, so focuses are very important, but it's the close, you know, it's the closest thing that we actually get to classes without being classes. Mm-hmm. And since you met, since given what given what you mentioned with with how with um how many how many um classic fantasy archetypes would fit on would fit under the combat focus um how do you how how do you make sure that they i'm guessing that the way you make the way you make sure that they don't that your choice of focus doesn't become samey is through the choice of 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 abil- of free abilities that you get right so you can have an, you can have four bahul that are all bahul. They all gain t- they all take two different types of abilities. Then they can go into the focuses. And let's say two go to combat, two go to knowledge. Well, in combat, you're going to have the ability to select um, abilities that are like uh, oh, I'd have to actually pull it up now. You now you've got me thinking about it. Um, ah, sorry. Give me a second. Let me whip out the player's guide here. Uh, so you would have the ability. Um, is it? This is. There it is. Sorry about that. So in the combat, you would have the ability to do like uh, acrobat fighter, armor proficiency, attack quickness, battle cry, battle sense, combative leap, champion, death strike. Discover Flight, you can choose two of those, right? So that gives you the same thing. So you're both combat focused. You're both fighters. But one fighter decides that they want to be a fast fighter that uses their skill of acrobatics to actually get bonuses and do other things in in combat. So they take acrobat fighter. Um, And one decides they are going to attempt to parry parry, uh, attacks more than try to dodge them. So they take that. They both take improved multiple strike, which allows them to reduce the penalties against them being able to uh, attack multiple times in a turn. Um... And then and with knowledge, you can pick alchemy, animal transformation, arcane appraisal, biomechanics, call familiar, um, inherent languages, necromantic sight, totem magic, and they can choose different ones there. So they're in the same archetype category, but they are now different, right? And then when you get into picking your first ability, um, we have there are 303 abilities that you can choose from mm-hmm. if you so want to. So they, you don't have to know them all, 
people are like, oh my God, there's so much. No, you don't. You just pick one and go with it. And Kralis is so flexible that you can pick an ability one time and go like, you know, that's not really what I want. I want to use this ability and be able to pick another ability. So you unlearn the first ability, learn a new ability while you pick a new ability. So it, it helps. Help, you can manipulate and massage your character all the way through its its uh its character life i guess mm -hmm. and <clears throat> with with that in, with that in mind when it comes to when it comes to advan when it comes to advancement cuz i I've, i did i i see the whole thing with rank um is it is it a case that each time you go up rank you get a, you get a certain number of of ca of character points, or do you have, or do you have a different approach? Because um, when a lot of people, when they think of classless games, they think of advancement doing the ex doing the experience as currency kind of approach. Well, I guess in a sense you could say that. So what we do is every character has their own merit table, experience table that they set for themselves each rank. Mm -hmm. And every time you rank up, depending on if it's an even rank or an odd rank, um, you get certain bonuses. Uh, if it's an even rank, you gain a new ability that you get to choose from, you gain a new heroic lock, and then you gain access to one free rank bonus, and then the ability to purchase, in a sense, up to three other rank bonuses, but can never be the same rank bonus, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the odd ranks, you actually increase your skills and your defenses. So those are always going up. Um, and it's it's kind of like a currency in the sense, but you're you're it's... You're, you're setting your own experience table on how much merit it's going to take you to get from second rank to third rank or third rank to fourth rank, right? Mm -hmm. One Maybe one rank you decide, you know what, I don't want to take any abilities and I just want to focus on skills, so you go up faster, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe you take an ability that costs, you know, it's, it's going to increase your merit rank that you need by 2,000 merit points that you need to get. Well, now it's taking you 6,000 merit points to go from fifth rank to sixth rank because you've taken some pretty awesome abilities, or it took a very impressive ability that's going to make you more powerful. Um, and so we, we don't, we don't have the currency in that same sense. What we do is it's, it's you decide how much merit it's going to take you to get from one rank to another rank, each rank. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of players that have actually, once they've actually understood it like that, because it allows them to be more flexible. So you're not always, so not everybody's earning the same amount of uh, experience points every time, right? Every, and I'll use D and D. No hate to D and D, but D and D uses an experience table which everybody's got to is got to follow for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. um, and here you don't have to. All you have to worry about is how much is it going to cost you for your species merit point cost, uh, the campaign merit point cost, and your ability merit point cost, and that's what drives how quickly you rise in the ranks and become legends. Mm -hmm. And what I do find interesting with you mentioning that is the, is how. Um... Obviously, obviously, in in um, in in a in say a D and D, they had di they different classes had different um exp thresholds for leveling up. Which right. I don't I don't have a I don't have a problem with I don't have a problem with that. I had a problem with the logic behind the execution. In what sense? Um. I'm I'm somebody who I'm somebody who like who likes to have a reason for any, for any mechan for. Um, mecha mechanics in the way that they are, and in a lo based on based on how they described a lot of the a lot of the classes, the I the idea of that the idea of that ver of that varied um that varied level of of XP for each cl for each class um wasn't al didn't always didn't always make sense in my head, and this, this, it's kind of tied to why I, why I've had a complicated relationship with the Vancian model of spell casting that D and D has used over the years, and don't feel bad about picking on D and D because one of the policies we have around here is we hold these truths to be self-evident that all <laughs> men are created equal. Right on, right on. Uh, and since I since I brought up the since I brought up the Vancian model, I do want to I do want to touch on on magic. Um, cool. Would it be fair of me to say that magic, whether whether it be arc whether it be div whether it be divine or otherwise, is skill based? Yes. It's, uh, it would be very fair for you to say that because it's based off of skills. So there are we have 
we have a magic we have three quote unquote magic systems right we have your arcane we have your divine and then we have another one that's called jinhur uh which is more akin to um the use of f the force in a sense I, like that's the only x that's the only description i can get into people's heads from to understand what it is it's it's you're not calling on gods to help you or you're not memorizing archaic formulas to do it it's an internal will of wanting to do something right um, and that's where that comes from i liken i liken what you said to psychics in very in various games or the mystics in runequest Close, similar but different. Um, it's the same premise, right? I mean, it's if we're gonna if we're gonna call it, it's all in the same light. Mm -hmm. um, but ours is a little a little bit little different because some of the things that you can do is with Jin Hur, for example, you can actually bring into into existence a Jin Hur at the same time you're making an attack because that Jin Hur that you just brought into existence amplifies your attack at that moment that you do it when you when you get into your attack. Mm -hmm. So rolling back to you know uh, the skill based we have spell craft divine knowledge and jin who discipline which are three skills that you that you would that you need to have to be able to cast spells quote unquote mm -hmm. but then you also need to make sure you have the appropriate ability to do it, to do that so someone can take spell craft they can understand yes that person is is casting a spell oh no by the way from my research i think that is a uh, yes, that is a firebolt he's about to cast. Everybody duck, mm -hmm. right? Without needing to cast. You would need arcane touch, divine presence, and enlightened to be able to activate the ability for your character to summon, call, or cast spells. Mm -hmm. And th that brings that brings me to one, to one other um, a one other aspect. Is is it a case where because of the fact that you have a fatigue point system? Is is that is that kind of the is that kind of the um, controlling factor with how much someone can cast that you can cast, but you it's it's not a case of you can cast this amount of spells per day. It's you can cast as much as you want, but you're going to get tired. Absolutely, you can cast the same spell over and over and over and over and over again until you run out of fatigue, mm -hmm. um, and that very rarely happens unless we're in like a really big battle with a really powerful creatures and you're a high ranking um because those some of the more powerful spells can take up anywhere from 45 to 122 points of fatigue to cast it um you know but it but they but for what you spend you're getting big benefit right mm -hmm. um so you have to determine you know do i hit them with a bunch of of power rank one two spells that don't cost me a lot of fatigue and then hit them with a powerful one or do i just go big and just hit them with the most powerful spell i have which is going to cost me like 144 fatigue yeah. um it, it's 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 a variation and then and even in that we have your ability so we have the uh uh casters have the ability to use fatigue to manipulate what how and where they cast things right um that's uh it's not it's not in the extended rules at all it's in the uh it's in the main rules mm -hmm. in the core rules um and one of them is uh, there's a list here of you, you know use of fatigue with spells and powers. <clears throat> you can increase the base damage of, of a spell by spinning fatigue. You can increase the duration if you want to. You can increase increase the area of effect. Want to increase the range? Cool. You want to quicken a spell to make it go from a full action to a move action? More fatigue. Higher casting. Do you want to cast a spell that's higher? out of your category but you know like you know it's like if you let's say you have it as a spell written in your spell book or you know you have access to it via your divine or you you're, you're learning it you can do that yeah you can try to lower the defense of those who around you uh, by spending fatigue uh you can say this spell is not going to fail i'll always even if i fail i get one success on it right mm -hmm. um and then there's these things where you can do uh uh, increased con concentration where you can concentrate on two spells at the same time that require concentration. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, a lot of options that casters and players can play around with to be as efficient and as awesome as they want to be. Yeah. And yeah. I never like the bank in. Oh, I cast that spell. I'm done. Okay. Well the wizard's going to hang out in the back of the thing back here for a while. I understand, we get a chance to rest. I understand why it was done. It's I I look at it as an artifact of um of ch of chainmail. Uh, 
<laughs> oh, it's absolutely an artifact of chainmail. Absolutely, it's an artifact. It's an it's an artifact of the whole tabletop um, wizards military as wizards as artillery, basically. Right. Exactly. It was artillery. Right. And which, but that is an explanation, not an excuse. And well, I didn't. I, I'm not trying to excuse it. I'm just saying that's what, no, what they no, did I'm, with it. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I, I'm. I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you are. I'm be, one. <laughs> It's um because the the it's called it's called the Vancean system because of well Jack Vance Jack and Vance right the the pro the pro the problem is the dying Earth, the dying Earth um, books are ve are very much in the realm of sword and sorcery and D and D kind of um even kind of leaned it did it did lean a bit into sword and sorcery but there's the whole not um will there's the whole there's a the whole issue of shit or get off the pot regarding what kind of fantasy it wants to be but it right. definitely has but there's a whole lot of high fantasy leanings high and high and heroic fantasy and it's kind of hard to do that same level of lo of low magic when you have met when you have magic literally everywhere in so many um ca so many campaigns and modules right oh but one th one thing that uh, one thing that I'm that I, w I was going to ask, but you but you kind of ended up answering is whether is whether or not spells were um fi were fire and forget, and it based on based on the whole thing you mentioned with fatigue, that's that that is definitely not the case, right? So I would like to p I would like to pivot into we into weaponry to a degree because. This is something that I often ask whenever you have, whenever you have a setting where oh, melee and melee combat and firearms are in are in re are in relative supply, right? Because it is it is very easy to make um, firearms too useful, right? So what I'm curious about is how is how you is how you um, balance that out so that so that. Um, so that fire, so that you don't have the issue of of firearms do, um, dominating play, right? So everything. So when it comes to so when it comes down to determining successes, like I said, so this kind of goes back to um, total number of successes uh, times the base damage equals what you can do, right? Of how much damage you can do, right? So we have an imperial sword that does nine points of base damage per success. So if you get 10 successes, you're doing 90 points of damage. With firearms, it's the same thing. They're still firing the same amount of damage. The only difference between firearms and, say, melee weapons, or, yeah, melee weapons, including even bows, is that they have a chance of malfunctioning every time you fire them. And that malfunctioning is a greater stepping um uh, a greater percentage, I guess you could say, a greater latitude of of when that occurs. If you've got a poor pistol, its possibility of it actually uh, failing is higher than 96 through 100. It's like 90 through 100. If you roll that, you're going to fail, right? Um, so there's a point where it becomes very dangerous. And then if it fails, there's either just a minor failure, like it just jammed, or it explodes on you. Yeah. Um, and that's with that's with what we call dark dust pistols or uh, gun, um, sorry, uh, black powder pistols, right? And, and and rifles. Rifles are the same way. Our energy blasters have the same thing, but they have a maximum damage that they can do. They can only be fired every so often because they ignore up to twenty points of armor and are very very deadly. Mm -hmm. um, but they also have the uh, the the ability to explode on you, and because they are powered by a item called a docal crystal depending on the color of the docal crystal you have a small nuclear weapon that you're that you're carrying around with you and it can do base damage of anywhere from 3d 10 times 10 to 12d 10 times 10 and damage mm -hmm. so you don't want to drop it you don't want to overheat it and you definitely don't want it to cause malfunction because it it can kill you just for its use and probably everybody around you for that matter and a yeah and it, it's yeah and a small i think like the i think the darkest one we have is called the black docal crystal i think it has or it might be i think the i think it's a black one it could be a white it has a damage radius of 60 feet mm -hmm. so a 120 foot diameter it that's the amount of damage it does to everything in that area yep 
And, so yeah. Mm -hmm. And go uh, ahead. The when it is given that given that cap and that risk and that risk of explosion, does that apply to melee energy weapons as well? Uh, yes, actually. So yeah, so we do have uh, we have uh, energy blades and energy stabs, and it's the same thing. The dokel, the, what's powering it? It's being powered by a dokel crystal or atomic battery, mm -hmm. and those things are while they're they're pretty solid. You don't want to you don't want to drop them. You don't want to crit critically fail with them. You don't want to do things that are going to potentially cause them to blow up on blow up on you, and they will blow up on you. Mm -hmm. um, one of our last sessions is they were uh, the, the, we were playing live is they were taking on this one queen uh, uh, monster queen that had I think she had like 500 health points and had a huge amount of defense and they're like well the only thing we can do is we've got these dual crystals let's make a bomb and they took them and they put them together without figuring out how much they would need and literally it ended up doing almost 200,000 points of damage to the area which did a radius of 150 feet in diameter that took down buildings and and just evaporated everything in there and the character who was actually taking the bomb didn't have the skill lore tech you can try it untrained tried it untrained and critically failed push the wrong button and bam so the risk he took was calculated but he's really bad at math right <laughs> oh and given 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 all given all of that, especially since this is especially since this is a game that you're that is not just taking place on one planet, but but a, but a whole omniverse, as you call it. Um, right, potentially, yes. Do you have you have have you guys con have you guys have you guys considered um, putting in rules when it comes to ships, especially when yes. it comes to ship combat? Absolutely, we actually have in in the, in the player's guide a whole section on not only ships but land vehicles, airships, void ships, land vehicles. Uh, one of the favorite ones that people like to try to get their hands on, even though it's expensive, are levitation bikes. Mm -hmm. um, and in the game master's guide, we have rules uh, for uh, battles on the sea, battles on, uh, on in the air, and battles in the void, and based off what they are. And in the player's guide, you can actually build your own void ship or airship if you've got the funds to be able to do so but those rules exist mm -hmm. and there's also a standard listing of okay i want to spend five hundred thousand silver pieces this is what i can get and here's the ship and then you can go in and modify that right mm -hmm. and i'm with that in mind i'm curious if you, uh, if um if there are plans to include uh, means of means of customizing what means of customizing weapons and armor um, so you can go in and customize that and that would be we didn't put any like specific rules in we want the GMs and the players to kind of build it mm -hmm. but they are there are skills that allow you to you know we have armor blacksmithing weapon smithing uh, and those kind of things and then we have a whole section that allows you and lures that actually allow you to create new technologies right if you want to create this this is what you kind of need to do right we've got we've laid out the, the base structure without giving absolute detail on x y and z it's there and if you put it together correctly you can create your own new type of um let's just say a landmine right you want to do a landmine in in the dungeon and you're building it you can build it mm -hmm. right you just need these parts good luck well, I could... thank you for giving me an opportunity to reintroduce the up button <laughs> 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 right on. The up button is a, is a, it's, it was something that I did because I wanted a trap based thief in my AD and D days, to the point where we had to basically homebrew the whole class ourselves. Right. Um, and one of it, one of his preferred traps is a was a mat was a um, essentially a essentially a magic landmine called the up button. You and the first person who steps on it after it's laid, um. Is treated is treated as if they cast fly on themselves straight up f at forty miles an hour for six seconds. Wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> so, which hence its name, the up button. You step on the thing, you go up. You go up very quickly. And right on. It do and it doesn't it doesn't matter if there's something in the way. The spell the spell says you're going in that direction for six seconds. 
which right is on. How, which is how it ended up killing a dragon because, well, the dragon got crushed to death. <laughs> oh, brilliant! <laughs> That's awesome. Because he had the brilliant idea of, hey, nope, nobody can just nobody can destroy my nobody can des can destroy my lair if I, if it's if it if it's in the if it's in a mine full of adamantite. Oh, right on. Which um, it's technically true, but the but the problem is adamantite is ridiculously hard. So, so it's right. not it's not going to give when he was when he ended up hitting the ceiling. Right. Oh, that's brilliant. I like that the up button. Yeah, I, I like um, there are so there are so many there are so many times I with trap design that I end up ripping off Looney Tunes. That, you know, um, the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote, those are probably the best places to rip off traps, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Now, granted, now granted, the ones that I rip off, I tend to have more of a success rate, but... <laughs> right. Plus, I had the I had the board game Mousetrap as a kid. Oh, I'd love that game. <laughs> and I've, um, I've, messed, I've messed around with Rube Goldbergs, and I've... And I've had way too much fun with um, games like The Incredible Machine. Right, right. So, there's so there's definitely there's definitely been that. But um, oh, that's awesome. I, I I like that. I like the, I like where your brain's going with that. You know, and I think that also helps with a lot of development in in traps because you know I I see a lot of GMs in various places forms like I'm having difficulty coming up with a cool trap, and I'm like, sometimes the coolest traps are the most easiest basic traps. You know. Like I think I think a lot of people when they think of traps they think of things like um some variation of pits or or um or the kind the kind of the kind of traps that well trappers would use in the real world. Right. But when you when you when you bring in the fa when you bring in the fantasy element you've got a whole you got a whole new set new set of things to work with. Um and there's there's no there's no reason to not, to not have um Say magnetic bolos, as as one particular thing, and that's a that's a tame example. Or, or ha or have or have it that stepping on the wrong plate ends up messing with the ends up um, messing with the point of gravity. You know, treating treating the ceiling as the floor in that in that instance. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, one of the uh, one one thing that I that it gets a lot of hate because of of what it was is. Uh, the uh, I don't know if you've ever played the Eye of the Beholder games. I have. For better, those or are for worse. some better or for worse. Those are some amazing traps that they had in those places. Yeah, I love those traps. They are complicated and they are dangerous for the time. Yeah, right? there's there's been times where I've where I've had it that um the tra that the trap that the thief just um just bypassed was itself a trap. Right. A little trapception. Trapception, right on. Oh, um, the trap within the trap. Yeah, and I love that. That's course, awesome. Of course, once you bring illusions into the mix, there's all there's all kinds of possibilities with that. Right. Oh. Uh, even even if even if it's just the cla just the classic fake door. Right, <laughs> right, and in the the player in the game master's guide, we give a how to build a trap. Mm -hmm. And then we give a number of simple uh, sample traps, ranging ever from a first rank trap mm -hmm. to a twenty fifth uh, rank trap, which is the entire room is a trap, mm -hmm. right? Like, kind of like uh, the old Indiana Jones and the uh, um, the collapsing ceiling, Temple of Doom. No, yeah, the collapsing ceiling of the Temple of Doom, where that ball is just slowly coming down, and you've got the uh, the spikes coming out of the roof. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where we actually do a lot of. That's where I draw a lot of that mm -hmm. awesomeness from. Yeah, and <clears throat> when it when it comes now, one of the things one of the things that was mentioned on the Kickstarter page in the for the GM's guide that I was a bit curious about is how, is handling handling chase scenes because this is something that some that some games have dipped into, but a lot of others have. Give, have given have treated it as just a as just a narrative thing or just another form of an encounter. Uh, when while that while that's cer while it's certainly an encounter, I I hes I hesitate to say that chase scenes should be resolved the same way you would resolve a normal combat scene. Right. 
So, I'm so the way the way chase scenes, the, the way we say you know you know starting a chase happens in Legends of Kralis occurs with a simple I'm going to chase them. Okay, well now before we start the chase, how far apart are you? Are you guys in short range? Well then it's going to be a matter of uh, agility checks and strength checks to see if the chaser can absolutely grab the chase right off the bat. If that doesn't happen, then the chase moves to a medium range and the chase actually happens. And as you move through parts of the city or wherever you're where, where wherever you have the uh, um, chase happening, there are things that could occur, right? Um, let me pull up the rule system real quick for you on chases. There are conditions that can occur based off of what you are doing, and it's on Chapter 5 Combat. That's Of course, that's where it's at. Um, and so that's how you set up the chase. And then step one, you determine the initiative to see who goes when and all that other fun stuff. And determining obstacles, right? And obstacles can be anything, depending on the table that you're using, right? Um, let's say that you're running through an urban... An urban... Uh, setting right a city maybe a town whatever you want to call it right um let you would roll a d100 and whatever you came up with is what occurred right so let's say that uh you rolled a 31 through 40. you spooked the horses with a cart you can either attempt to calm the beast with an animal handling check or dodge the hooves which is an agility check if you fail at any of those you become delayed, right? Um, and the consequence for your failure is your delayed number of turns. And if the if you are delayed as the chased, you could potentially give the chaser momentum or bonus movement to catch up to you on the on the next move, right? And so you're always doing this thing. And so as soon as a chased gets outside of the long range, they've escaped. So you can have these different chases happening in like dungeons and rooftops, forests and swamps, mountains and hills that we have available for you that we've written. Mm -hmm. So it becomes more of a dealing with the consequences and the uh, obstacles as much as anything, right? And then we also have uh, skills that allow you to actually become better with that in a sense, like the evade skill. Um, but what we tried to do is we tried to incorporate both attribute checks and skill checks for you to be able to um, go wherever you need to go, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that, I know, given the... Given uh, does that answer your question? Does that yeah. give you an idea of what we're talking about when it comes yeah, to chases? It does. Yeah, it does. That it's, 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 it's more than just a combat, right? It gives you this ability to narratively drive what's happening in the story with the chase obstacles and the consequences, right? Mm -hmm. You could get caught because of the fact that you were running through the forest and you didn't see the little branch and you didn't duck and it smacks you. Mm -hmm. And then your your consequences, you're delayed uh, four turns and they the chasers gain bonus wise could maybe gain uh, a plus 25 on their next move trying to catch you you know and then we have part of part of the combat we have three types of moving right we have uh, hustle running and sprinting which you can do double triple or quadruple your movement and you pay fatigue to be able to do that so there's all these really crunchy bits in it that flow very well that just they don't they shouldn't stop the combat or the chase scenes in any way um right now, and it, as an aside, I I could easily see the benchmark for a lot for a lot of people when it comes to chases being the speeder bike scene in Return of the Jedi. Okay, right, right. Not saying that every chase has to be like that, but that's going to be one concept that's going to be planted in people's heads of wanting to do that. Right, and you can do that, right? I mean, uh, let's say you have a a uh, a. Uh... Levitation bikes. We have levitation bikes. And actually, one of the adventures that we actually have uh, up is called Against the Iron Lords. And they start off being chased 
as they're escaping a building and they have to get to their levitation bikes and they are chased through the city on their levitation bikes by the Iron Lord's henchmen in an attempt to escape with a specific crystal that's got information embedded in it to bring it back to the Senate of Dajota Shiva. And that scenario has ended up in so many cool, interesting ways. We've had one person actually sabotage their, their levitation bike, jump onto the bike, the, the back of another one, while that levitation bike that was sabotaged blows up and it blows up underneath or near a building, causing it to collapse, which causes the, the, the uh, chasers to have to take time to get around it. Right. And, um, we've had them where their levitation bikes have been shot out from underneath them. Now they're running through buildings trying to escape with this thing, right? So it's been it's it's interesting to see how that works. So you could do that, right? In in the way we've got the chase obstacles and the chase scenes and the chase mechanics set up. I can I can certainly I can certainly see that. Um, and with. And with that, with that in mind, given the given the vast given the potential vastness of the, of um, this particular setting, and the reason why I brought up the whole omniverse thing is, even even within that, it do you have are you going to be putting in some material on a um, on an example area to to allow players to kind of build off of? How do you mean? Whether exactly. It, whether it be, whether it be like a ga a gazetteer of a city, a gazetteer of a of a of a of a planet, or a, or or multiple planets, um, or e or even just a collection of story seeds, something something that something that a GM could build off of, so that so they're not thrown right into the middle of this huge ocean of space and just be and just be told what do we do, it. right? Yeah. So uh, as so that's. That is a barrel of monkeys and a ton of worms to unpack. So I actually have written um, just under a thousand page uh, world of Kralis campaign guide that I've got. It doesn't include maps or anything like that. It's written in texts and stuff like that. Um, that takes uh, takes place all throughout Talos and tells you all these different areas without being too specific. Mm -hmm. Right? Um to the point where you can do you you can have your own setting, but it's got enough of the campaign setting that you can actually do that. So while I was putting this together, I'm like, people are now starting to ask me about the lore. And while there's lore within the player's guide itself that's written for the species, there's no real lore where you're where you were for Talos to actually do this. So I'm putting together the Kralis Gazetter, which is a player's introduction to the world of Kralis, or specifically Talos. And the various realms, and then there's also sections on the omniverse, uh, where you know these different planets and things actually exist, and 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 all that other stuff. So there is a wealth of information that I have that I want to get out. Um, eventually, it's either going to be printed, which will likely be printed into four or five or six different gazetters that you can collect, which will be about 180 to 200 pages each. Mm -hmm. um, or I'm going to put it on a Wikipedia and stick it up on the website that players and gms will be able to use kind of like a fandom site yeah. um that's this is the, this is not it's not the lore as it is so much as a travel guide to these things right the lore is going to come from the players and the gms as they build there's nothing like you know this particular um area has this and you can't divide that right there's one area in talos right now it's called the empire of rinsha intra and it's been in a continuous civil war for the last 120 years mm -hmm. um and what's interesting about it is they're using mechas the best way to describe it in fighting some of these civil wars so you know you've got cities that have been blown apart villages that are like you know torn apart and then right around the bend you've got a crashed airship that has been buried into a mountain and next to it is a um 30 foot tall mecca like clockwork thing that is been destroyed somehow right like a leg is missing or half its chest and its arm is missing um so you have these different things but i've set it up in such a way that players gms specifically can go in and set what they want to set and tell stories they want to tell and if they want to use the reference they can 
Um, so there are places that exist that I'm putting into. And one of the, one of the places that is we, I generally start adventures off in is the small town of cold iron um, that's set in a borderland like esque mm -hmm. region between uh, the city of Jad and the empire of Insha Insha. So they get a lot of trade and, uh, people fleeing or people going to try to see if they can change the 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 what's happening there. Mm -hmm. And now I I know you're I know you're putting in uh, putting putting out three books: the Player's Guide, the GM's Guide, and the Bestiary. Um, what are what are you shooting for as far as the page count for each? A lot, <laughs> and it wasn't so much I'm shooting for this, right? It's 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 going to take out however much space it needs. So uh, the Game Master's Guide is 394 pages. The Player's Guide is 390 pages. And I think the Beastry is clocking in at 400. Um, and people are like, well, those are thick, heavy books. Well, yeah, they are. But they've also got a lot of information in them, right? Um, like the Game Master's Guide, one part of the Game Master's Guide, which is environments, has a city section in which... We give you maps of what a city, like a little chunk of a city would look like. And they have these numbers on them to tell you the the height of various roof rooftops in case you want to do a chase across those. Um, or we have geomorphs of, of cities. Or we say, here's what a standard tavern looks like. Here's what a standard inn looks like. Oh, by the way, here is what a standard quote-unquote apartment complex might look like in Dardura Shiva, the, the greatest city in, in the Wall of Kralis. Um, then we have, and again, I've cut my teeth on old stuff. We have incorporated you to create a random dungeon and dungeon, uh, map pieces for you to put that together that you can copy from the book and trace and do whatever you want. Right. Um, so that's, those are the biggest chapters. The smallest chapters in all the books, especially the, the player's guide and game master's guide is the combat. They run, they check in at about 25 pages mm -hmm. and they are just, discussions on okay what about this high ground versus low ground those kind of things things that people might want to know um we've also included a uh a narrative how to how to run a narrative combat with no dice being rolled um and a narrative combat where it's theater of the mind you know distances and things like that so we've included those as well um and so that's basically where we stand with that i mean they're big books, but they've got a lot of information. And the Beastry, while it's 300, 400 pages, the first chunk of it, the first 25 or 30 pages, is talking about how to, like, how to advance a monster, the damage tracking, uh, wounds and retreating, monster AI, um, templates that you want to... You want to assign a shadow template to a monster? Here's a template. You want to make it a... Um, a an elite template. Here's that template, right? Um, more, more uh, morale. Um, understanding the undead. Why is there so much in, uh, undead? Uh, theranthropy. You know why? How does theranthropy work? And then the back part of the book has got appendix A and B, which is we walk you through how to create your own monsters and all the monsters abilities that we currently have for this particular book. And you can create your own monster if you so like. And it's just like creating a character. And I definitely appreciate that because, well, the I on, I honestly think I honestly think that monst that monster creation systems should be semi mandatory these days. I agree because players know too much about the monsters already. <laughs> well, the, you certainly in my opinion. that's there's certainly that, but there's also there's also the fact that so many so many times I've been told I've been told certain certain games. Um, can run and can run any kind of fantasy, but when it comes to the when it comes to the monster list, I essentially have to create it out of whole cloth, uh, with without in, without any real guidance. That's the reason why I brought up the whole um, swim. Damn it! You know, imag imagine someone's swim right. lessons being them being pushed into the deep end, just told to not drown. Swim. Right. Don't drown. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and that's and the thing is, is so. Um, What's interesting about Legends of Kralis, I don't know if I think it's interesting, is just because you build a monster 
to do X, Y, and Z doesn't mean that it can't gain the same abilities and do the same things that players can do. Mm -hmm. um, so you can increase a standard cre creature, a humanoid, a monstrous, mo monstrous creature, to become a powerful fighter, right? By using the same things that are open to players. So that book crosses both planes. So you can have a a 10-foot ogre that is a knowledge-focused spellcaster and is wielding a giant hammer, right? And and that's easily done. Yeah. And with the, now with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I say that because, you know, I mean, there's still a little bit of art that I want to get done that I need. I've got art places I need to get finished. Uh, I need to probably throw it through another um, editing round um, that, that I want to do. I mean, technically, the book the books are 95% done besides missing some basic additional images that I want to put in. And I have funded this all off of uh, off of what we've earned and what you know what we're capable of doing. And um, my very gracious wife has allowed me to play at this hobby for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, um, there's tons of images. Almost every every creature that's in the player's guide or in the, in the monsters guide has an image, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think, you know, based off of when the Kickstarter, if the Kickstarter funds are not funds that we have currently, I think we're going to ultimately release probably August for everybody and still, and continue to, uh, continue to, um, build the community around us you know like i said i've got three groups in britain that i play with uh regularly on weekends i'm starting another one fridays coming up soon real soon um on on, on another person's twitch channel that they're gracious enough and as af have asked me to come and do this so you know um yeah um the, the books are technically re ready right um, I just got to get through the concept of that I'm okay with them being done, <laughs> right? Yeah, which um, well, I don't, I don't think you're going to turn into the tabletop version of Star Citizen, so you've got that going for you, right? <laughs> right. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's just how it fits right now. You know, I mean. I would like the Kickstarter to fund. If we don't fund, we're going to try it again in May um, because of other additional research that I have found mm -hmm. um, and get more word of mouth out there. Which I, which I can, I can certainly understand. And I will, I will be looking forward to seeing how this particular, th how this particular thing develops. Uh, and with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And well, I, I hope I've answered everything you wanted answered. I hope I was articulate in what you wanted to do mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, thank you for reaching out to me and um, asking to be interviewed. I really greatly appreciate it. And um, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. Oh, ah, awesome. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Ah, oh, brilliant. I should have poured myself a beer before that. I did not know that. We'll definitely do that again. And of course, um, a, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>